Well, hi there, and thanks for joining me to learn about option trading myths versus reality. My name is Jason Ayers. I'm Director of Business Development and a Derivative Strategist with RN Croft Financial Group. I'm also an educational consultant for Learn to Trade Global and an educator for the Montreal Exchange. As always, we want to make sure that everybody understands the information that we're going to share with you here in this recording is for educational purposes only. just want to recognize that the options market, not unlike any uh, financial security, does carry with it uh, some risks. And it's very important that you understand what those risks are before you actually go and start trading this market uh, yourself. So we want to take a look uh, at a number of different uh, myths and misconceptions associated with uh, trading options. Um, we're going to look first at uh, just some misconceptions around the utilization of put options and, and their risks comparative to the use of call options. Discuss a little bit about what a zero-sum game is. Um, identify the difference between stock and index options. We'll discuss uh, some myths around um, option premiums. We'll also look at uh, myths surrounding uh, the profitability of option contracts, as well as uh, some myths and misconceptions around uh, the strategy of covered call writing. So let's just jump right into it here. Uh, many investors look at um, options as an alternative to the typical approach to uh, managing their portfolios. Um, while options offer a, a number of different solutions to help meet a, a number of different investment object, uh, objectives, um, it's, it's still uh, unfortunate that they're widely misunderstood by the general uh, public. And um, what ultimately ends up happening is that these myths and misconceptions arise uh, due to a lack of understanding. So for those of you that are going out and trying to educate yourself on you know, the value of utilizing options and, and look to discuss these values with folks that are maybe a little less educated in this particular, um, utilizing this particular security, um, there, there tends to be a dip, bit of a disconnect and, and um, a, again, just a, a misunderstanding as far as just what the risks are associated with options. And so, you know, it's unfortunate that you as a proactive investor, taking the time to learn about the dynamics of the options market tend to get discouraged by those uh, that are misinformed. So we want to look at uh, just, uh, again, starting with some general uh, misconceptions. And the, the first one really comes from the idea that put options are more risky than call options. The reality of this is that puts are actually priced identically to calls based on the potential for the stock or the underlying security to move either higher or lower. And um, risk is really at the discretion of the investor uh, and it's going to depend largely on the strategy selected so again the recognition that um, you know uh, selling a call option that is not covered by the um, by holding the underlying uh, shares is in fact more risky than buying a put option and again, so the, the risk associated with the strategy is going to be directly related to whether or not you are a buyer or a seller, whether the position is covered, whether or not it's a spread, uh, not whether or not it's a put option or a call option. Now, many of you have also uh, maybe heard of the uh, concept of a zero sum game and uh, the idea that a zero sum game means more risk. So what is a zero sum game? Well, it's the theory that the gain of one participant is the same as a loss of another. So for example, the call buyer pays a dollar and the call writer receives a dollar. When the call option expires, the buyer has lost a dollar and the writer has gained a dollar. So in that situation, uh, one market participant is out the dollar, the other has, um, has uh, gained the dollar. And so the um, net result is zero. So Zero sum game, game plus one minus one equals zero. Fact of the matter is options are a zero sum game. Yes, but it does not mean that there's a defined winner or a loser. Um, because uh, many um, strategies are implemented to meet many different objectives, the, the um, loss of one premium to an option buyer um, maybe simply because they used a put option as a hedging strategy against uh, holding the underlying security. And as a result, the, um, you know, that investor, that option trader has in fact successfully achieved the objectives that they were looking to, uh, to achieve. 
So again, a covered call writer that sells a, sells, sells a call for income might be assigned and have to deliver the shares to the call buyer who wishes to own them. But really, at the end of the day, that was exactly what the covered call writer was intending. And so as a result, they don't feel that there was a loss. So the, the, the options market ultimately, well, certainly there are um, people that are gaining a profit and people that are, are losing. Um, there tends to be an area of overlapping interest between options market participants, in, in which case both uh, participants are uh, benefiting in, in, in a way that they set out to benefit from. Stock and index options are the same. Well, in reality, index option premiums are determined using the same options pricing variables, but stock options and index options actually differ in their contract specifications. So when it comes to the underlying act, asset, uh, exercise and assignment procedures, uh, settlement procedures and trading units, uh, they, they each have different characteristics. So if we take a look at uh, this table here, you'll see that for a stock option or an exchange traded fund option, the underlying um, is in fact a particular stock or a particular exchange traded fund that is options eligible. Whereas for an index option, such as the SXO options that are available on the Montreal Exchange platform, um, the underlying is the S&P TSX 60 index. And so what happens is because they are essentially different um, financial securities, different financial instruments, the multiplier uh, around uh, the cost of the option contract is different. So for example, for stock and exchange traded fund options, one contract equals 100 shares. So you would simply multiply the premium by 100. With the SXO options, it's $10 per S&P TSX index point. And so you would multiply the option premium by the, by the $10. Now, as far as exercise and assignment is concerned, again, very, very important to understand the, uh, the difference between the two. For stock options and exchange traded fund options, they are American style and exercisable at any time. Whereas for SXO options, they're European style and only exercisable at expiration. And this has a lot to do with how these um, particular contracts are settled. So for stock and ETF options, it's in fact the shares of the underlying that the uh, option contract is settled for. And so throughout the life cycle of the option contract, an option buyer may choose to exercise their right to receive the appropriate number of underlying shares associated with the contract that, they've, uh, that, they've, uh, that they hold. Um, for SXO options, they're cash settled in Canadian dollars. So the interesting consideration here is that if you're utilizing an SXO option as a hedging strategy in a diversified portfolio, you really don't have to worry about whether or not shares of the underlying security uh, are going to be um, you know, delivered or sold out of your account. If you're utilizing put option, for example, uh, they are cash settled for the difference between the strike price associated with the contract and the settlement value uh, of the, um, of the um, index itself. Now, the other consideration is the last trading day. So for stock and ETF options, it's market close on the expiration Friday. For SXO options, it's actually market close the day before uh, the expiration Friday. In fact, um, these SXO options are priced based on the opening value of the index on the Friday morning. And as a result, um, if you are trying to manage your position, you need to be trading out of that the, um, the before close on the, uh, on the Thursday. So let's touch on some option premium myths. So one of the myths that uh, tends to be discussed in uh, great detail is that high option uh, premiums should be sold because they generate a greater income. In fact, this was probably one of the first mistakes that I made in, in my sort of desire to generate cash flow utilizing options. It's the idea that, you know, I should be always searching for the most expensive option contracts because that means I'm going to be able to generate the most return. But in reality, Option premiums account for all known information. And in fact, they are priced um, specifically um, for the risk and, um, and unpredictability associated with a particular underlying uh, security. 
And so the higher premium is in fact reflecting a certain degree of event risk or material stock volatility um, you know, in the underlying security. And so um, what happens is the option writer is getting paid to assume a higher probability of having to fulfill the obligation of uh, delivering the underlying security, or if you're a put writer in purchasing the underlying security. So one of the sort of general rules of thumb uh, that we um, always like to consider is, do we in fact want to own the underlying security or do we in, are we in fact comfortable with selling or delivering the underlying security based on the um, premium that we are collecting because again the higher the premium the higher the probability it is that we are going to have to uh, assume ownership of the underlying security or in fact deliver shares of the underlying security now let's look at uh, probability myths so one of the other considerations are that options are too expensive. So, you know, it really it isn't worth my while to to try to use options because they're just too expensive. Well, we want to recognize that market makers, which we'll touch on in a few moments, price options according to all known information. So we've already discussed that in the context of more expensive option premiums. Um, and so we want to recognize that the market maker's job is to um, price options as fairly as possible so that they can um, provide liquidity so that it is um, there is a value in an investor or a trader uh, utilizing a particular option contract. And so when they're posting their premiums, it's based on the theoretical value calculated um, based on a number of different variables. And then subsequently, the market forces will sort of um, push that option contract into you know its its true market value based on where prices are being executed at we want to recognize though that that we can be a buyer and or a seller of an option contract at any time that is really up to us and what we're trying to accomplish so if we in fact um, consider options to be too expensive because you know maybe again it's a very volatile stock there are a lot of different strategies available to help us offset the cost of that option contract. So, you know, we could use um, a spread strategy. So we could, you know, we could buy a call and then subsequently sell another call option at a higher strike price, collect that premium, and that ultimately will help offset the impact of implied volatility and the overall cost of the position. Uh, we could also choose to implement the covered call strategy or be a put writer, in which case we are taking advantage of a more expensive option contract. Once again, recognizing that, you know, be just because the um, option contract is more expensive doesn't mean it's a better contract for us to sell, but just recognize that we can choose the strategy that we feel is appropriate to, to participate if we feel that there is a, um, it, you know, that options are, are a little pricey um, at any given time. The other consideration, of course, is that commissions and spreads on options are too excessive to make profits. Again, um, we have to be uh, in a position to assess uh, each situation independently. And so, um, you know, we, we want to recognize that, again, the, the option premiums as they are displayed in the market are based on the uh, various um, different pricing variables that the market maker is pricing in to uh, the contract. And so what will happen from time to time is if a market becomes a little more volatile, a little more concerning, the market maker will widen the bid and the ask, which is what when we're referring to spreads, this is essentially what we're looking at uh, referring to. And so, again, we can choose what strategy we wish to utilize and we can also determine as far as uh, uh, spreads are concerned, we can also um, go in at a limit order and maybe try to see if the market maker or the market in general will uh, get us in at a better price or get us out at a better price by, by simply defining that price and seeing if there's any takers. And so there's ways to manage around the spreads. Now, as far as uh, commissions are concerned, um, the impact of commissions is going to be dependent, of course, on your account size. Um, and the uh, other consideration, of course, is that 
uh, you know, if you are concerned about commissions, then you may want to consider being less uh, less active of a um, of an investor. So rather than doing, let's say, weekly uh, covered call writing or weekly put writing or even monthly put writing, go out and um, and go over a longer time frame. And then that way, you're not going to be um, uh, incurring as frequent of commission uh, transactions when you're managing your portfolio. And again, uh, just to uh, just to touch on uh, spreads are going to vary depending upon the stock and market conditions. So, you know, one of the ways that that we really try to manage that uh, that um, uh, consideration is by making sure that we are uh, only implementing strategies on, you know, highly traded, highly liquid stocks that have highly traded, highly liquid option contracts because the more heavily traded the option contracts, the narrower the spread differential between the bid and the ask, and the more um, effectively we can get in and out of the positions at prices that we feel are, uh, are fair and appropriate for what we're trying to accomplish. The other myth or another myth is uh, if I buy options and the stock doesn't move, I lose all my money. Well, in reality, that profitability is dependent upon the strike price selection. So always remember that that you know there are different components to an option premium. We talked about this in our op, um, in our options basics uh, webinar. Um, intrinsic value, which is uh, which is part of an in the money option contracts value, uh, does not decay with time. And so if you um, are buying an option contract with um, both time and intrinsic value, it's only the time value in the option contract that will erode uh, as you move closer to expiration. If the underlying shares do not move in value, the intrinsic value uh, always stays the same. And so if you're concerned about how um, much a stock is going to move or whether it's going to move or not over a period of time, um, then you need to step back and either make sure that, um, you know, you buy a, a an option contract that has significant intrinsic value. This this lowers the time value component and and it puts the profitability of the position um, more um, to be more impacted by the move of the underlying security, either positive or negative, and less about the passage of time. The other consideration as well is that you have the choice to close the position anytime before expiration. So, you know, if you're starting to get close to expiration, you see the option premium depreciating in value, um, and you feel that the stock maybe is not going to move as you anticipated, you can close the position and uh, hopefully get away with, uh, with uh, salvaging a certain percentage of that time value premium uh, as well as the intrinsic value premium and uh, move on to uh, to another opportunity now the other interesting consideration that i i've, I've heard uh, you know right from the beginning in terms of my career is that market makers are there to take advantage of small investors and it's really based around the idea that market makers control the direction of the market and they seek to manipulate it to their benefit the reality is that market makers are there to ensure liquidity and to quote a two-sided market. The only way that a market maker um, profits is by collecting the spread differential between the uh, between the uh, bid and the ask. And so, you know, when you look at a sort of uh, the options market in general, uh, you may have a, a bearish investor that wants to, you know, maybe. Um, you know, sell calls or create a, you know, spread or buy puts, and they're going to, you know, post their, uh, their trade to the market. The market maker is going to either take their, you know, take the opposite side of it, or they're going to find another investor that is looking to, you know, achieve something opposite to what, let's say, you do, and they're going to facilitate that transaction. So they're going to, let's say, um, you know, buy from you at the uh, bid and they're going to sell to the other investor at the ask and they'll make the difference between the bid and the ask and they'll do that all day long. So what the market maker does is basically accepts the risk of holding a certain number of shares or a certain number of contracts on a particular security in order to facilitate trading. And so the interesting consideration here is that if the broader market is bearish and let's say buying all puts, then the market maker is essentially the seller of puts and is for the most part assuming a bullish stance and so what they need to do is they need to either close um you know that position 
uh, or, or, or execute that position from their own inventory, or they look to seek an offsetting order for another market participant that is looking to do, let's say, the opposite of what you're, you're doing. And if they can't do that, then what they have to do is they have to hedge. And so they'll go out and they'll either short stock or they'll go long stock or they'll buy a call or sell a call or buy a put. And they'll use all of the different um, uh, 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 pricing variables and all of the different option Greeks, which are basically the, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, titles assigned to the different pricing variables to help them neutralize the impact of the positions that they've created so that they are insulated from any significant move in either direction. So again, market makers job is to provide liquidity. They either buy or sell from their own inventory or they will seek to find another order uh, uh, from, uh, you know, from another market participant or they'll look to hedge. But their job is to make sure that they remain as neutral as possible so that they're not impacted by either a move higher in the market or a move lower in the market. Um, it's important to understand really um, at the end of it all that uh, as an investor, we are con in control of our investment objectives. We're in control of our directional bias. We're in control of the strategies that we'll use to participate. And we are in control of our risk management and capital allocation strategies as well. So we, we have to take responsibility for all of the different variables that we have control of and recognize that the market maker at the end of the day is really just there to facilitate liquidity. They're the buyer for every seller and the seller for every buyer. We're the ones that are responsible for um, our risk exposure and how we are participating in the, uh, in the markets. So finally, let's take a look at um, the myths and misconceptions around the uh, covered call strategy. So one of the you know, considerations is that you know, most options expire worthless. And you know, that's what sort of attracts people to want to be an options writer or a covered call writer. In reality, once again, this is directly dependent upon the strike price selection. Out of the money options, that do not have an intrinsic value have a higher probability of expiring worthless, whereas at the money options, uh, which are option contracts with strike prices close to where the underlying security is trading at, um, have a 50-50% probability of having an intrinsic value on expiration. And this is in fact why um, you, know, you will get less premium for an out of the money option contract than you would, let's say, for selling an at the money option contract because the market or and the market makers are pricing in probability. So there's a lower probability of the uh, out of the money options having an intrinsic value on expiration. So they're priced less less than the at the money option contract that has a higher probability of having intrinsic value uh, on uh, expiration. Uh, interestingly enough, according to the Chicago Board Options Exchange uh, or the CBOE, uh, approximately 10% of options are exercised during the expiration cycle. So what that means is that you know somebody that that owns a call or owns a put, um, 10 10 of the time will exercise to either sell the underlying shares if they own a put or um, buy the underlying shares if they own the call option. 55 to 60 percent of options are traded out of before expiry. That means that if I've sold the options, I'm buying them back to cover before expiration. If I bought the options, I'm selling those options before expiration. So again, 55 to 60 percent of contracts are not even held all the way to expiration. That leaves about 30 to 35 percent of contracts that uh, ultimately do um, uh, expire worthless or are um, left to expire worthless. So let's look at the myth around uh, covered call uh, performance and the idea that, you know, if you are implementing the covered call strategy that you're going to uh, uh, underperform. Well, um, the profitability of the covered call strategy is really a function of the market environment. So what's happening, uh, you know, with the underlying stocks. Um, it's also a function of stock selection, and it's also a function of risk management. So once again, when we are implementing this strategy as the investor, 
we have the choice as to um, you know how we are applying the strategy. So are we going to do at the money option writing, which uh, limits our cap the capital upside opportunity, um, but brings in more premium? Uh, are we going to do this on stocks that are very volatile, where there is a higher probability the stock's going to move higher and we're going to get called away? Uh, are we prepared to hold a stock position? Um, regardless of whether or not it's dropping in value just for the sake of implementing the, the covered call strategy. So all of these um, variables factor into the profitability of the, um, of the, of the uh, strategy. And really statistically, um, the uh, covered, call, uh, straight, uh, covered call writing strategy has demonstrated historically that it, that it can increase returns but also lower the volatility of a portfolio and increase the sharp ratio. Um, and the sharp ratio, for those of you who, who uh, aren't sure, is a reflection of the amount of return that's been, um, that is generated for every unit of risk. And so if we take a look at this um, chart here, you'll see that in the uh, red, we have the MCWX, which is the Montreal Exchange Covered Call Writers Index. And um, that actually is a reflection of um, option writing at the money on the S&P TSX 60. And then in blue, we actually have the ETF that reflects the S&P TSX 60. And so what we can derive from this over a longer period of time is that the uh, the overlay of the option writing strategy on the S&P TSX 60 has over time delivered a, a greater return, but as reflected in the standard deviation has done so with less volatility, with less, you know, um, uh, less of a roller coaster ride for lack of a better description, uh, and has also uh, delivered a greater return uh, for less risk. So in other words, you've got a better risk reward ratio associated with the covered call writing. Now, again, remember that in, in, both circumstances, there's always the the risk of loss. So, um, you know, your risk in the covered call writing strategy is still if the underlying security uh, does drop in value. But because you're collecting premium on a regular basis, that helps mitigate that volatility. And that's how the strategy as reflected here within this little comparison chart has um, demonstrated a, um, a, um, a less volatile um, um, trading behavior uh, and has been able to deliver a better risk reward um, return uh, ratio. So on that note, folks, just a quick reminder that um, there's lots of uh, educational material available on the Montreal Exchange uh, site. Uh, we also have blogs that we're writing at optionmatters.ca, uh, lots of trading guides and strategy guides and calculators for you to utilize it in your uh, you know, uh, along your learning path. And uh, of course, uh, lots of great videos uh, available uh, on the uh, National Bank Direct Brokerage site. So thanks very much, everybody, for um, taking the time to learn about some of these options, myths and misconceptions. And I look at, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to uh, presenting to you in our uh, next video. Thanks very much.